Hi, this is Dr. Dan Ratner, and today I am meeting with Dr. Dave Clark, a double board certified doctor in internal medicine and gastroenterology. He's the president and co-founder of the PPDA, that's the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association, and author of the book, They Can't Find Anything Wrong. Today we're going to talk about his work with mind-body issues, both as a doctor and as an advocate for the advancement of the diagnosis and treatment of these symptoms. If you haven't already, click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and put your comments below, and I'll be happy to answer them myself. Dave, I wanted to welcome you to the show and thank you for coming on. It's always an honor to have somebody who's so uh, who looms so large in the field. I know you won't say that. You're a modest type, so you probably will disagree with that. But when we get into what you do, you'll, the audience will see why, why I'm saying. So the place that I usually start, um, this will be interesting for us because I know I've had people on who had their own experiences with uh, what what you call PPD, psychophysiological disorder. Some people go by TMS, the Sarno term, tension myositis syndrome. Others go by MBS, mind-body syndrome. We'll refer to it mostly as PPD here because that's a part of your work, actually. But when I have people on, some people have had their own personal experience with it. In talking with you before, I found out that you actually have it. That's and right. that and that that actually in some ways was a challenge to the work. So let's start Let's start with how you got into the field because many people get into the field because they have the pain and then they get interested in it. For you, it was a different story. How did, how did you come to this work? Well, I was trained uh, as a traditional internal medicine and then gastroenterology specialist uh, physician. And I was got all the way to year eight out of nine years of formal training with no knowledge of this field whatsoever, uh, which is, you know, kind of embarrassing to admit as a physician, since it afflicts 35 or 40 percent of the people that, that come to see us as doctors. And then to go through that many years of training without ever having heard of this is, is just crazy. But I finally encountered a patient that none of us could figure out. She had come to us from another university. I was at UCLA in my training. And She'd come to us from another university where they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. And we did some specialized testing. It was perfectly normal, as was everything else that had been uh, looked into for her. And I was doing her exit interview, and I stumbled on the fact that she'd been severely abused as a girl. Uh, nobody had touched her against her will for uh, something like 25 years. But there was this you know, glaring piece of history in her background that um, made me wonder if there could possibly be a connection. So I got a psychiatrist involved whom I knew slightly at the time. Her name was Harriet Kaplan, and she was unusually also board certified in internal medicine. So she had an interest in, in mind-body disorders. I didn't think anything was going to come of it. I didn't think you, a psychiatrist could possibly uh, do anything with the severe level of illness that this woman was suffering from. But nothing else to do. So off she went. And um, I forgot about her until I ran into Harriet uh, in an elevator one day and asked her, you know, whatever became of, uh, of Christine, the patient that I sent to you and was shocked to find out that Christine was completely cured with um, less than three months of weekly uh, counseling sessions with Harriet. And that just shocked me to my core that you could just by talking to somebody alleviate their symptoms and i thought you know i've encountered one patient like this there may be a few more in, in my future when i get into practice i should learn a few things learn you know the basics about uh, what is involved here so that i can do a good job for patients like this uh, down the road and I learned from Harriet. We prevailed on her to, to sit in with us in the outpatient uh, gastrointestinal clinic. I learned some more that way. Uh, but I never really thought it would uh, amount to much until I got into private practice in Portland, Oregon, and was seeing five or six of these patients every week. And my not having suffered from this personally made it a much bigger challenge to try to figure out what was going on. I had hoped that I would just be able to send them all off to the local equivalent of Harriet Kaplan, but in Portland, there were no such people. And it, it turns out that that Harriet, like Dr. Sarno in New York, Harriet in Los Angeles, there aren't very many people with this uh, sort of background. Uh, so I ended up having a lot of these patients come back and say, you know, now what? Can you please help me? And over the next uh, three, four, five years, largely through trial and error, I 
I learned what it took to make these people better. It's, but it's, even when I was a fumbling beginner, I was getting better results um, than you know anybody else out there with traditional medical approaches. So I was encouraged to keep going. It's it's a great. It's a great point on many levels, and I just want to highlight that. You know, I really think it's true that people who are kind of at the beginning of it, they think that they can't help, but a lot of times they really can help because they're actually giving something so different than what other people are receiving. I also wanted to give you some some real proper credit, Bec and you can, sh you know, shoo this away if you like. But I think that to me, it's part of the role of a, of a psychologist, of a doctor, of whatever profession we're in to, if we're not helping the people to, to wonder why and to, to reach out to other people and to check out other options, you were the kind of doctor who cared enough about your patients that you were like, well, we're going to try some other things. All right? and, and if I catch wind of something that might have worked, I got to know that. So... To me, we need many, many more doctors with that kind of attitude. I, I hope, I think there are a lot out there, and I hope that there's increasingly more. But what's your sense in what you see? Do you feel like there is an openness in medicine to this sort of thing? Is that is that growing? Is that changing? I know you and I share in common. We want to spread this message. We want people to understand it. Yeah, it it is. I mean, I think we're reaching a, a tipping point. I think. People um, were treating a lot of this, particularly the people with pain uh, with opioids, uh, and it was pushed very hard back in the 90s. And we have certainly found out since then that that's not a good idea, and people are desperately looking for a viable alternative. And the psychophysiologic uh, approach is absolutely a viable alternative to people with chronic pain. Uh, we can achieve vastly better results with far fewer side effects uh, using psychological approaches uh, than we ever could uh, using opioids to just treat the symptoms. So yeah, doctors are looking for this. They don't necessarily want to do the psychological work themselves, but there's a parallel movement <clears throat> that supports this uh, direction that we're going, which is called integrated care, where you have a, a medical clinic and a mental health professional or what's called a behavioral health consultant working side by side in the same medical office. And when the physician uh, uncovers uh, a psychophysiologic issue in a patient, they can call the uh, mental health specialist in, you know, right as part of the same visit. There's no stigma about, you know, having to go see a quote unquote shrink about this, which many for many people is a barrier. It becomes part of their, their medical care. And the outcome from that are tremendous. I mean, I, I had, uh, you know, a number of places around the country where um, we've done training, the, the PPD Association has done training for clinicians. And I just, you know, in the last several months had a physician take me aside and say, you know, since we've been doing this work this way, it has put the joy back into my practice. So wow. it's, it's good on multiple levels. Yeah, I, I that's a great point too because I think it's better for it is better for the doctors just like you're saying it it it's humanizing everybody it's bringing us all together it's allowing us to learn from each other but I think it's so great that you have been a part of this and that you had that attitude about it I wondered if you know when you were when you were treating people uh, at the beginning and and ongoingly what role it has played that you didn't have your own experience with PPD and it's amazing that you avoided it because I know so many people who had it and I had eight years of, of chronic back pain and that's how I discovered it. But I know, I think Howard Schubiner didn't have a, a major PPD experience himself. Um, I, I think I'm remembering that correctly. You he tells a story about having um, bowel problems when he was an intern. So that, that may have been his, oh, okay. uh, his major experience. Uh, he, okay. I see. He, uses the phrase uh, being scared shitless literally <laughs> that's and i love that you know the language that we use really does apply I, I i'm writing a book on this as many people have done or are doing and i talk about the fact that this language is often quite quite literal and in fact i wanted to ask you about that this is a great lead in for a gastroenterologist I wondered what it's like working with these particular issues. Do you find that gastroenterological issues are harder to treat than other PPD issues? Are they similar? How how are they? How do they stack up against you know pain issues? 
Yeah, I, I think um, it is even more important to get to the deep psychological work uh, to uncover the, the source of the repressed emotions, the trauma, the stress. Um, you know, there are people who can be cured of uh, pain in the spine or in joints uh, through uh, just lessening the fear that they have around those symptoms and um, through um, mindfulness meditation, for example, or from reading books. Um, but I found that the, the gastrointestinal symptoms in particular, um, uh, you need uh, to go to the deeper work uh, to find the source of um, repressed emotions. The, the hardest thing for me, the, the biggest barrier as a person who'd not suffered this, was to understand that people were uh, experiencing very powerful emotions, um, but beneath the surface. They, they would sit there, like this, this, even this very first patient that I was describing, when she was talking to me about the severe abuse that she suffered as a girl, she was using the same tone of voice you would use to read a grocery list. You know, all the emotions were going yeah. into her gut. Um, and they were not anywhere to manifested uh, in, in the way she presented herself. And this was, this was normal and typical for, uh, for my patients to be describing um, terrible experiences that they'd suffered, um, but all the emotions were invisible. And wow. that confused me for a, a couple of years that, you know, why were these people ill? They're describing these terrible things. Um, they're not emotional about it. They, they seem like they've probably processed this trauma, that they've left it in the past. It's no longer a factor. And yet they have these terrible symptoms. So, you know, what is the connection? And the connection was that they've got, they're like dormant volcanoes with boiling magma of emotion that is manifesting physically, but on the surface, you're not seeing it. And it took me hundreds of interviews before that finally dawned on me. Wow. That, that's, that is fascinating. And I, I think it's highlighting something important that different symptoms can function in different ways from a PPD standpoint. That, and, and I think you're right. Some, some we have to look more deeply at. So part of the work that I do, we haven't gotten to talk about this in the emails we've exchanged, partly because I've developed it more in, in the last year or so, is that I I work with people not only on the emotions, but then also on the cognitive side, the doubts they have about it, because if they're not certain about it, and I read, you know, of course I read about that in Sarno and Schubiner and Schechter, all of these different books, that being certain is key. But what I have done is, is worked to develop systems with those specific minds about how we can get them more certain with science and logic, and then also help them be more powerful. And I think, I do think that when it comes to gastroenterological things, a lot of times there is a feeling of not being powerful, not feeling like they can manage things. And in fact, it's a, as we know, it's a very uncomfortable symptom to feel like you're, you're dealing with because it could come at any time. I actually had a question. Um, it's about the various things you hear about in gastroenterology and what could be a mind-body thing versus what could not. So I'm just going to mention a couple. Uh, one is celiac disease. People talk about leaky gut, Crohn's disease, colitis. For the people out there who don't know the difference, and I'm including myself in that, I'm not an expert on these things, which of those, if not all or none, can relate to a mind-body process or be confused with one? Yeah, well, you can have uh, a mind-body process uh, at the same time as you have uh, any of those. And it can be uh, very confusing uh, for a physician to try to sort out what's happening uh, when you have both simultaneously, trying to figure out what the relative contribution is. You know, you, mind-body uh, problems don't cause Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or celiac disease. Um, leaky gut is, you know, a category in and of itself, but most of the symptoms that are attributed to leaky gut are actually mind-body. So I'll mm -hmm. just I'll just leave it at that. We could go on for ten or fifteen minutes about that one, but um, you could have ulcerative colitis, which is um, capable of causing uh, diarrhea, uh, but you could have a mind-body uh, irritable bowel syndrome simultaneously that is also capable of causing diarrhea. 
uh, one of my more dramatic cases uh, had both at the same time, and it was only when uh, both issues were successfully treated, you know, the ulcerative colitis uh, with um, the cortisone infusions uh, and the mind-body with uncovering the stress that the man was suffering from. And when we dealt with both of them, then he got better, but it was only when we dealt with both of them. So it, it uh, the same thing can happen with celiac. There are a lot of people that um, are not recovering from their celiac with a strict adherence to uh, diet in the way that we would expect. And, you know, in that kind of person, we should go searching for uh, stress, trauma, repressed emotions, and see what we can find. Uh, fascinating. And and if we are lucky enough to have you back on, maybe we can talk more about that. It's, it's an area that I always want to be a little more clear on as a psychologist. It's great to be able to refer to a doctor who knows what they're talking about from the medical side of things. And I, I also just wanted to echo that from my vantage point, I think, yes, there can be combinations and exacerbations and we have to follow the logic of, you know, like if you think you have celiacs, but you actually can eat gluten, you probably don't have celiacs, you know? Yeah. So, and you know, I, I would also add that uh, it speaks to your point about uh, convincing yourself uh, that you've got a mind body disorder for with a lot of my patients, um, you know, they're, they don't start out convinced. And so I'll say, well, look, we're going to, we're going to work on um, a gastrointestinal approach to you. I'm a traditional medical approach. We're going to do potentially endoscopies to look for things and tissue sampling biopsies uh, to look for uh, underlying diagnoses. But at the same time, we're going to try to uncover stress, trauma, and repressed emotions. And when we find those things, we're going to treat them. And we're going to see if uh, you make progress uh, in doing that. And if you do, that is going to convince you. It's great that, that you lay it out there at the beginning for them to understand. We could Very go first visit. Very first visit. And now, when did you write your book, uh, They Can't Find Anything? Yeah, They um, Can't Find Anything Wrong was uh, anything wrong. published mm -hmm. in uh, 2007. Yep. And um, it's actually, that's when I first heard about Dr. Sarno. I was on a national tour uh, giving speeches and doing media appearances around that book. And somebody in an audience raised their hand and said, hey, you sound like Dr. Sarno. Uh, I was actually in uh, in Chicago. And I said, well, that's that's good to know. And I promptly went out and got a copy of Mind Body Prescription and could clearly see uh, a lot of parallels um, between the work that we were doing. So you so you went pretty far down this path even before you discovered Sarno. Is that correct? Yeah, I, it was uh, 2008 um, that I first heard about Dr. Sarno and, and read his book. Um, so it was, uh, you know, he was in New York and I was on uh, the West Coast in Portland, Oregon, and he does uh, back pain and I was doing gastrointestinal symptoms. So I just never had occasion to uh, become familiar with what he was doing. But, you know, lots and lots of parallels um, in our approach to things. And when you do, so you... You talk about stress illness. That that's the some of the terminology that that you have used for this. How do you treat that? Uh, you know, and I'm I'm talking about before then, and if it's evolved, you can tell me about that too. Yeah, it um, it reached a somewhat of a plateau probably after uh, I'd been doing it for ten years, which would have been uh, the mid '90s, uh, and a group of us got together in 2010 and. We're trying to uh, unify our terminology because there are, you know, must be a dozen different synonyms for this out there. And we settled on psychophysiologic disorders because it, it, it's a, really a blend of psychology and physiology is, is what's going on here. And uh, we thought that would appeal uh, to physicians. It doesn't appeal, honestly, as much to patients um, because it has that psycho prefix in it. But right. if, you know, if you understand that it's psychology and physiology blended together, uh, it makes more sense. Um, so that's usually how I refer to it nowadays, or PPD for short. And in terms of treatment, you know, I'm looking for um, my assessment involves what kind of stress are you under at the moment? Uh, and a subset of that is, are you the kind of person that takes care of 
everybody else in your world, um, but has difficulty putting yourself on the list of people you take care of. And that turns out to be very common. A lot of my patients, they, they're on a treadmill, they never get off. They're constantly uh, right. solving problems everywhere but themselves. Um, and then <clears throat> the biggest shock to me was uh, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, um, major paper uh, by Vince Felitti in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine in 1998, describing the long-term impact of these on people's health, one of which was to triple the rate of people having these you know, multiple symptom uh, disorders. And the long-term impact of those ACEs involves all kinds of things. Um, as you know, um, self-esteem is beaten down. Uh, your, your sense that it's your job to fix problems in your family, to fix problems in your relationship, and to worry less about yourself. Um, perfectionism, uh, being hypercritical, uh, you know, all of these personality characteristics that uh, Sarno observed in his patients, they're a direct outgrowth of uh, what the child was doing to try to cope with adversity when they were growing up. And it's not always out and out obvious abuse. Uh, you know, my, uh, my that very first patient I mentioned, her dad had sexual intercourse with her an average of once a week for f age uh, from age four to age 12, you know, just, uh, you know, a horrible uh, experience that she went mm. through. But other people, it's it's more subtle. Uh, right. You know, it can be as, as um, something like uh, never being able to get approval uh, from your parents or, or always right. being egged on to achieve more. You jump over one bar and the bar is moved higher and you got to keep trying to, to get uh, even further along. And right. that can, you know, beat a kid's uh, self-esteem down. So there's a wide range of uh, types of adversity that can result in um, these physical symptoms later in life. And then the last three areas I look at um, has the person got a depression and anxiety disorder or a post-traumatic stress um, <clears throat> that is so prominent physically that the diagnosis has been missed by their doctors? And is, is it just the awareness? I mean, I, we all look at these things differently and we know awareness can go a very long way in this, but is it is it just the awareness of the connection that tends to bring the relief or are um, there more things that you... yeah? Yeah, it can. I mean, the very first story in my book is a patient who was hospitalized at a major West Coast university uh, 60 times over 15 years with no diagnosis. Uh, and she saw a dozen different specialists, including a psychiatrist, and they all missed it. And as soon as we uh, were able to uncover the connection between a particular stress in her life and her attacks of symptoms, um, that was it. Once she saw the connection, she never had another episode. She was having severe uh, dizziness uh, attacks with uh, nausea and vomiting. Um, but other people, you know, they need to um, first um, recognize the repressed emotions that they have. Um, Howard and uh, Mark Lumley, Howard Schubiner and Mark Lumley uh, developed a form of treatment called emotional awareness and expression therapy. And the, the approach that um, I came to via trial and error uh, is pretty much exactly the same uh, as that. Uh, it involves first helping people become aware that yes, they do have these emotions uh, going on in there. They're just being expressed physically. Uh, and then once they become aware of the emotions to put them into words, either uh, speaking them to a therapist like yourself or uh, writing them down on a piece of paper or uh, on a computer screen, um, one technique is to write a letter to the perpetrator of your uh, childhood adversity, not to mail it, just to write it, to put all those uh, thoughts and feelings down on a piece of paper. And right. if you write it by hand, it's, you know, that, that physical uh, motion has a magic ability to uh, pull thoughts and ideas out of people's heads that they didn't necessarily know were there. And the, the more of those ideas that go on to the page, the less they have to be expressed via the body. It's really interesting, too, the difference between them writing it and typing it because it's like the body is doing that a little bit more. I, more I encourage people to hand write it, um, <clears throat> but, you know, typing works, too. So I want to talk now a little bit about some of the work that you've done. Well, first of all, let me say it's fascinating to me that you came to this without Sarno because so many of us came to it with Sarno or maybe with 
someone like you. But you were a doctor who just paid attention to it and, and saw how things added up, and you came to a very similar conclusion. And that, that to me is encouraging that another doctor doing very similar work could come to similar conclusions because they're true. We, we see it everywhere. So now I know you've done a lot of work working to bring these ideas to as many people as you can. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that you do, not because you don't know them, because of course you do, but so that the viewers will know. So we had on Georgie Oldfield at one point. She uh, she runs SERPA, the Stress Illness Recovery Practitioners Association, and you are the international advisor to that group. And I I think it's it's great because she is working, and I'm sure you with her, to get other people trained in these ideas. And that's a big part of what we need to do. If we're going to change the dialogue, we need the people who are helping to understand this. But... She, you know, you also were one of the, the co-founders and you're the president of the PPDA, the Psychophysiologic Disorder Association. And the idea was to unify some of the way that we're talking about things. But I also know it's it's about advancing the diagnosis and treatment of these illnesses. And I just want to highlight some of what's there. Um, there's research that you guys are doing. I know Howard Schubiner and Alan Gordon are, are doing some of that you're working on, or maybe this is already going, the model clinic in Las Vegas. Is that already going? Uh, yes. Um, Howard is heavily involved in um, teaching people how to use these methods in a uh, real live primary care environment. Um, on the ppdassociation.org website, we have a uh, full online training course um, that we deliberately kept the jargon out of so that um, medical professionals can take the course without worrying about encountering psychological jargon and vice versa. You know, the, the mental health professionals uh, can take it without running into medical jargon. And because the jargon's out of it, patients can take it too. We've had a number of people who are not healthcare professionals uh, who've taken it just for their own uh, personal benefit. Um, and similarly with the, uh, the textbook that we came out with a little over a year ago, um, that's written by, uh, edited by four experts, but we've got a total of 16 contributors from all over the English speaking world. Um, that's a, a excellent compendium of uh, the latest thinking in the field um, that can be used to educate uh, any kind of healthcare professional. And I'm hearing that are, there are a number of therapists now who are recommending it to uh, their patients because their certain fraction of their clientele are interested in the science and find it more compelling than um, your average self-help book like, uh, like my first book. Well, and that's part of what you guys are doing that's so successful and so helpful to the rest of us is there. there's data on the outcomes in these things. There's science included, and it is so appreciated because I'll tell you, I'm not one to want to do the scientific research. <laughs> I, it's, not, it's just not my thing, but I believe in scientific research, and having that evidence is helpful. Uh, you know, you have other ways that you're you're doing things. I know there's a documentary you guys are working on. I think it's called Pain Brain. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And, you know, that's on top of a documentary called This Might Hurt, uh, which you can uh, access at This Might Hurt Film. Uh, I think it's .com or it could be .org. And an earlier one called All the Rage uh, also yeah. highlights uh, this this whole field. Yeah, we actually we had Michael Galinsky on a number of weeks right. back. And I talked to him when that was unfolding, and I just watched This Might Hurt actually this weekend. These things are, are they're just fantastic movies. I encourage everyone out there to check them out. But I love that we're doing things on multiple fronts to get the information out there. As you know, part of the reason I'm doing this podcast is to raise awareness about this, to talk about these different things. And having people like you on is such a blessing for me and my viewers to get a sense of the, the different types of things that are going on out there, but also the unified feeling that we're starting to have around this. We're, tr we're all trying to connect with each other, and that's part of what I want to do here. I want to know my colleagues in the field, not just to know them, but to work on things together about how do we advance this? How do we think about these things? And 
So I just I want to thank you for coming on. It's it's been great having you. I hope we can have you back. We can talk about the gastroenterological yeah, issues. No, I'm so so glad that you're uh, you're doing this uh, podcast, and it's uh, you know an excellent contribution uh, to the field, and it shows everybody that you know here you have this this range of people that have come from all kinds of different backgrounds, both personally and professionally and in their training and in the kinds of patients that they've seen over the years. And we've all converged on very similar uh, principles um, that we find uh, just simply from doing this work. Um, and that gives me a lot of confidence that we're all, um, we're onto something, that we're all on the right track. And now, you know, in 2021, you we've got over 200 scientific publications in a bibliography on our website that support what we're doing. So this is not um, fringe uh, science or quote unquote alternative healthcare. This is uh, should be mainstream. It's 40% of the people who come to see a primary care doctor and it, it absolutely should be uh, available to anybody with a, um, a physical symptom that's unexplained. And I, I can't thank you enough for your work in it. And we will put we'll put that website down in this so people can go there and check it out. I really encourage people because there are a lot of people who need the science. That's the thing that will actually reduce their doubt. And that's where a lot of those papers are. But it, the PPDA site is fantastic on a number of levels. And I admire the work that you've done. I appreciate the work that you've done. And, and I'm glad we're we're in the same field working at this together. So thanks for coming on, Dave. Thanks, Dan. It's been a pleasure. So every time I have somebody on, I'm blown away by the varied directions it can go in. When I first met Dave in person for the first time, because he and I have traded emails before and had various interactions, I'm a member of the PPDA, I didn't know that he didn't have his own experience with mind-body issues. And I'm always fascinated to learn about what people's experiences were like. When we had Elisa Batson on, I was surprised to learn that she had suffered from mind-body symptoms longer than I had. That's not something that I usually found in people working in the, in the field. And I thought uh, Dave talked about it beautifully, what it's like to have discovered this on his own. Here's the other thing that totally shocked me. My assumption often has been that everybody starts with Sarno and then they branch out. But he developed very similar systems all on his own without even knowing about Sarno until 2008. So he did discover Sarno before I did, but not long before I did. And, and what was amazing to me is that he's the kind of doctor who th thought, well, what is actually going on here? To me, that's real science, paying attention to all of the facts. You don't shut out certain facts that don't fit with your science. And I really admire that about Dave. And I know that that's one of the reasons he's done such good work. It's also really important in our community to have people who do different things. So as a gastroenterologist, he's the number one guy I would go to if I'm trying to tease out, well, is this a mind-body issue? Is this a physical issue? It's great to have these people on board in that way. But then the other thing that I think is so impressive about Dave is all of the things that he's doing to make things better. We're all working really hard in our, our various ways, and I appreciated that he's appreciative of me about doing this podcast, trying to spread the word. But Dave's doing so much as the leader of the PPDA, and all of those things that he's doing are advancing our work. And I was encouraged to hear how much he thinks we've come such a long way in the last decade. We want to keep coming further, to keep getting you guys the information you need so that it'll be different than when I was suffering and I didn't have all the information, although I was lucky enough to have Sarno. There were people before that who didn't even have that. And now we have the internet to spread the word more. We're coming together as a community and, and the, the conversation is, is turning in a good way. And I encourage all of you out there to try to spread the word you know, in whatever way works for you that you believe, I'm not asking people to go door to door on this, but the word of mouth really does matter. And the more we talk to each other in the field, the more we find that that is true, that it is the patients who are starting to spread the word now. And that's important because we're getting uh, the help to people that really need it in a different way. So I want to thank you all for watching again. If you haven't already, Please click subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, hit like if you like what you're hearing, 
and put your comments below and I'll be happy to respond to them myself. Thanks again for watching.